Welcome to Rising Parent, your go-to podcast for navigating the stormy seas of childhood tantrums. I'm your host, Edna, and I'm here to help you weather the storm and emerge with a calmer, happier family. In this episode, Tim and I are diving deep into the world of tantrums and exploring effective strategies to manage them. From ignoring to expressing, we'll cover it all. So grab your favorite beverage and get ready to learn how to turn those meltdowns into moments of growth. Let's get started. Welcome back, everyone. Today we're taking another deep dive. And this one's all about those, uh, those little humans who, well sometimes have big feelings. You know what I'm talking about? Tantrums. Exactly. We asked you to send in your notes on handling toddler tantrums, and wow, you guys delivered so much good stuff in here. Oh, it's a gold mine. Mm -hmm. And what I love is you're not just looking for quick fixes. You're really trying to understand the why behind the what, right? Oh, yeah, because anyone who's ever been within a five-foot radius of a toddler tantrum, you know, it's not just about getting them to stop crying or screaming in that moment. It's about, like, figuring out how to help them navigate those big feelings. Yes. And that's where things get really interesting. So before we jump into the strategies, you know, the actual how-to, I think it's important to really understand the why. Because honestly, when you're in the midst of a tantrum, it can feel very, very personal. Oh, absolutely. Like a personal attack on your very being. Right. But here's the thing. For toddlers, it's really not about you. They're not mini manipulators, even though it can feel that way. No, no. They are definitely not masterminds at that age. No. What's happening is, their emotional regulation skills, their ability to like process and manage big feelings, those are still under construction. Oh, that's a great way to put it. So it's like their emotional wiring is still getting hooked up and sometimes it just gets overloaded. Exactly. And then boom, meltdown city. So let's look at some of those tactics you all sent in because there are some real gems here. One that came up a lot was the idea of ignoring a tantrum. This one always feels a little tricky, right? Because how do you ignore a tiny human who's like, lying on the floor, kicking and screaming. Right, and this is where we have to clarify what we mean by ignore. We're not talking about neglect, ever. We're talking about strategic disengagement. Hmm. Because sometimes the attention we give, even negative attention, it just adds fuel to the fire. Oh, that makes so much sense. Like, even if we're saying, stop that, stop crying, we're still engaging, and that can actually make it worse. Exactly. So strategic ignoring might look like, you know, calmly and quietly continuing with what you're doing, no eye contact, no lectures, no giving in to demands. You're essentially taking the attention away from the behavior. Yeah. And you know what? Often, that's enough to help them start to de-escalate on their own. Because they realize that tactic isn't working. Precisely. And this leads us to another really interesting strategy that several of you mentioned. Giving choices. Now, I know what you're thinking. Giving a toddler choices during a tantrum sounds like a recipe for disaster. Right. But again, it's about understanding the why. At this age, they are all about asserting their independence, right? Oh, yeah. So when we offer limited age-appropriate choices, it gives them a sense of control in a situation where they're feeling completely out of control. It doesn't even have to be anything major. So instead of saying, do you want to put your shoes on, which is a recipe for a resounding no, it's more like, do you want to wear your red shoes or your blue shoes? Perfect example. Yeah. You're still setting the boundary. Shoes are happening. But you're giving them that little bit of autonomy, that little bit of control, and often that can really shift the dynamic. It's all about picking your battles, right? But in a way that still gives them a sense of agency. Now, another strategy that came up a lot was allowing emotional expression. And this one's so important because, you know, we're often conditioned to want to shut down big emotions, right? Oh, especially in public. Don't cry. Shh, calm down. Right. But here's the thing. Emotions aren't bad. They're just information. Mm -hmm. And if we can teach our kids to identify and express their emotions in a healthy way, that's a lifelong gift. So instead of saying, don't cry, we can say, it's okay to be sad. I see that you're feeling sad right now. Exactly. You're validating their feelings, mm -hmm. which helps them feel heard and understood. And that, in turn, can actually help them start to regulate those emotions more effectively. So much of this comes back to how we, as the adults in the room, are handling our own emotions, right? And speaking of that, one thing I noticed throughout all of your notes was this emphasis on staying calm during a tantrum, which let's be honest, is easier said than done. Oh, absolutely. But it is so crucial. Because here's the thing. Kids 
especially toddlers. They're little emotional sponges, right? They mm. pick up on our energy, our stress, our frustration. And if we respond to their meltdowns with our own meltdowns, well, it just escalates the situation. Yeah. But when we can model calmness, even when we're feeling anything but calm on the inside, it can actually help co-regulate their nervous systems. Co-regulation. Is that like our calm begets their calm? You got it. And that's why creating a safe, comforting environment is so important, which, by the way, many of you mentioned in your notes. Mm -hmm. And this ties in beautifully with co-regulation. Yeah. And you even use the phrase safe space to describe it, which I love. What exactly do you mean by that? It's not about, like, sending them away to their room as punishment, right? It's about creating a designated space, a cool-down zone, where they can go when they're feeling overwhelmed. It could be a cozy corner with pillows and books or maybe a little tent or even just a specific spot on the couch. The key is that it's a safe, familiar, comforting space where they can ride out the emotional storm. So it's like a designated space for emotional processing. Exactly. A place where they can feel safe to feel their feelings. And we don't pressure them to get over it quickly. We let them move through it at their own pace. That's such a powerful image. And honestly, I think it's something that a lot of us adults could use too, right? A hundred percent. Who doesn't need a designated cool down corner in their life? Right. Well, I think we've covered a lot of ground today. This has been such an insightful conversation as always. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. And you know me, I always like to leave our amazing listeners with something to ponder. So here's my final thought. Pay attention to the patterns in your child's tantrums. Are there any common triggers? Does the intensity change in certain situations? Mm -hmm. Do they happen more when they're hungry or tired? Because those patterns, those are like clues, right? Yeah, yes. They can give you such valuable insights into your child's individual needs. And the more we understand those individual needs, the more effectively we can support them. Love that. Tuning into those individual needs, that feels like a perfect place to wrap up. And listeners, if you're enjoying these deep dives, make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss a single one. We're back next week with a brand new topic and a fresh perspective. Until then, keep those requests coming.